Coming up on Theater Talk. I don't tend toward the scathing mm -hmm. when something's just bad. But when I get the whiff of cynicism, it puts things into a different category. I am not obligated to promote the business of Broadway. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and with me is my guest co-host, the mighty Elizabeth Vincentelli oh. from the New York Times, The New Yorker, and the podcast, Three on the Isle. Mm -hmm. And this week, we are going to talk about the 24-hour plays from the Roundabout Underground, which is happening April 9th. It is an extraordinary event that our guest will tell us about. We have actor Gideon Glick, Last seen on Broadway in Significant Other, quite magnificent, and you, you were in Spring Awakening when you were about five, but you were pretty cool, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> the wonderful Richard Kind, who was in The Big Knife, and many things, including the funniest episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm oh, that I ever saw. <laughs> and Jill Rafson, who is, I'm gonna get your title right, Jill, you're pulling this whole thing together. You are the artistic producer of the Roundabout Underground, and you are assembling these people for this 24-hour play's benefit. Elizabeth. So I guess if you could explain to us, I, I mean, I realize we live in the uh, age of TV binging, but the 24-hour play does not last. 24, right. It's not a play that is 24 hours long. Right. It's the whole soup to nuts cycle takes 24 hours. So it's conceived, it goes from zero to 60 in 24 hours. Exactly. The, you won't have to watch a play for 24 straight hours. The event starts uh, the night before what you'll see on stage with all of these writers and directors and actors gathering and uh, sorting themselves out, uh, trying to give each other inspiration. And then the writers go off overnight, create these short plays, come back the next morning, share their scripts, and then go take a nap. Um, and the directors and actors go off and put it all together. And then they perform it that night. So uh, it's a really exciting way of showing off all the creativity that's in the theater industry in New York in general, but also uh, for this particular version of the event, it's Roundabout Underground partnering with the 24-hour plays and showing off some of the artists we've been cultivating. Mm -hmm. So now, what, what, how many writers are involved in this? It's six playwrights. And are they, a, a Gideon, are, are you assigned to certain writers or does this happen in the process? No, I think it happens kind of, I, I don't actually know night. how it works, but I assume they pick. I do. Richard Kind, Richard, you know how you it take works. it? Yeah. I do. You show up. <laughs> uh, every, every artist shows up, actors, writers, uh, the directors, they all show up. We all probably are in a very big circle, it's very communal, and you pick a prop and a costume, and you, you wear it, you stand up, you introduce yourself, and a writer will look at you. And then, they'll, you'll, then the actors get assigned to different writers, we don't know who. The writers will then, they have the toughest job. They stay up all night, they drink coffee, and they write a play. <laughs> At 8.30 in the morning, we come, having had a decent night's sleep, and we start rehearsing. And we rehearse the play, we memorize the lines, we'll go over it and over it in this short amount of time, and then at night, I guess 7 or 8 o'clock, mm -hmm. you put on a play. Richard, you have a lot of improv training. Yes. That you, that you can do this. And disdain for writers. And disdain. <laughs> <laughs> but getting, but getting into, is this, is this something you've dealt with before that you can do, just jump into a play and do it like that so fast? No, I'm terrible at memorizing, so I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little frightened. Um, but I'm good at paraphrasing. <laughs> but I don't know. But that might you, be frowned upon. You do. Yeah, of course it is. You you do try and do the writer's poetry. The writers have spent all night writing a play. Say the damn words. And they're you good know, writers. You try. You try. Are you going to mess up? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I it's part of, the, sometimes it's part of the fun. Well, that would be the most wonderful thing, the mess ups, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? You know, you, we're not there for mess ups. Well, yes. I don't mean mess ups, we're, but I mean no, the spontaneity. Yes. The, the, there is an energy that is different from opening night, even though it's opening and closing night. Uh, that one 20 minute segment is opening and closing mm -hmm. night. Um, you hope you don't pull a Harvey Corman, Tim Conway, because you don't want to do that. You don't want to. <laughs> What's the Harvey Corman? Well, you, you start laughing, you start oh, giggling, oh, oh. you mess up, yes, you start improvising. Um, but you, you do try and stick to the script. 
Um, now, I'm going to say that I have not done the 24-hour plays, but I have done 24-hour musicals. Even but harder. Did, did you, you would also think, have... You would think, but rhythm of a song will help you memorize lines. So there is something. They made a documentary about the 24-hour musicals. What is it called? What, it, it's called One Night Stand. One Night Stand. Fantastic. And there's famous people in it, uh, like Christian Borle and Ra Rachel Dratch and a, a lot of people. It's a fascinating, very quick from what happens, if you want to see what happens in the morning or, or the night before, what happens in the morning, the rehearsal process, and then we how Rachel Dratch really screws up. Can I drop out? And I, she's a regular. She's done so yeah. many of these. I know. The people will make mistakes. So, yeah. so you, you, you had mentioned earlier that you have to pick a prop. I mean, you have, but I think the actors actually bring the props. So you I'm, I'm saying, you, right. you bring that, do they use it? Do they use that costume? Is that, uh, you see, I often wonder, have the writers already written oh, a play? That is frowned upon. We're of course to it encourage is. Them. No. Of course it's yeah. frowned upon. <laughs> However, an ego is an ego, you know, and, and they, want, they want to put up something that's different. You're shattering all my illusions. <laughs> I have awesome. a feeling it doesn't happen. I, I have a feeling they all play by the rules. But are we randomly assigned to the playwright oh, no. or the playwright so, picks? So it's like dodgeball. Yeah. Oh, no. Cool. No. That's, I don't <laughs> know. Oh, right. Like dodgeball back right. Then. Oh, yes, I like got I'm not there. Who here was <laughs> picked first in dodgeball? Oh, yeah, 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 good luck. <laughs> who, who, who here between 42nd and 52nd Street was picked first for dodgeball? <laughs> <laughs> I think so, part of the fun is that the the writers get inspiration from right. what the actors are showing them that night. And so hopefully the people who get to watch that process as it's getting started will then see, oh, this actor said in the room, you know, I brought this rubber chicken and I know how to do a handstand. And it's fun to see how much of that ends up on stage later that night. So I think that's part of the excitement of it. It what is, but, I, but I, I'm not a huge fan of that gimmick. Which gimmick? Mm -hmm. The, uh, <laughs> oh, I was inspired by the... Uh, uh, the rubber chicken that he brought oh, in. I see, I see. An actor's persona, uh, or, or maybe they know his work, or what they're saying uh, that night, how they introduce themselves, is an energy that I really hope well, they get. What's the point yeah. of the rubber chicken, then? I mean, it, what's the point of the prop? prop. I mean, it, it, a, might give, it might give, it might give, yes, it's a variable. It might give a writer inspiration. The costume that you wear that I brought last time, is it's a zoot suit that I wore on Sesame Street. So will <laughs> I bring that? Yes, I'm going to bring that. Uh, and I hope they never use it because I look like an idiot in it. You've worked a lot with, with young playwrights. I have. And you've been working on plays that, I mean, we know with new plays, they're often rewritten all the time. So you are given new pages mm -hmm. in previews. I would assume that's a little similar where you have to learn new lines. You have to redo well, it is similar, Locked but there's a like context that you're you're right. more comfortable in, and you're you're more accustomed to. Right. This is more of like a, <laughs> and you just gotta go. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, remember, in in movies, it takes forever to shoot a movie, and yet recently Christopher Plummer did quite a large role in what these six days they yeah. shot. Now they knew exactly what lighting they were going to use. They knew every setup, everything. But they did his movie, and he's a big part of it in six days. The, I think that there is a waste of time in movies. Is there a waste of time on Broadway? I don't know, but I'll tell you this. I've oh. been in workshops where, or, or know of workshops where when they started first day of rehearsal uh, for Broadway, this play has been rehearsed to death. And yet still they're going to rehearse and another six. And, but, and, and still come, another six weeks. You come out of Second City, you mm -hmm. know, back in the day when it was the concept was something wonderful right away, that it you get is. up there, still is, and you get up there and, and make theater. And, the, and, it, and that is so magnificently interesting to have theater done that way. By it me. is, but it's interesting for that moment. Yes. Those improvs, if you take them verbatim and put them into a show verbatim, yeah. they're not going to work. You do it one night, you get a germ of an idea. You do it a second night, you refine it. It's a piece of coal that you try and make into a diamond. You cut it down, you rework it, you write in the afternoon, you make something that's perfect. It takes time to make a really good sketch. Yeah. Uh, and then put the, all those sketches together and make a really good show. It does take, take rehearsal. This is, it's a gimmick. You can't expect people to pay a lot of money to see these plays Every, every night, it's not going to it's not going to be that kind of theater. But for that night, it's priceless. It's magical. They've been it's, doing it's 20, magic. Yeah, twenty four hour th plays for years. But yeah. now, what's your biggest concern for April 9th? As <laughs> you're coming together, 
What's your biggest worry? <laughs> well, I think what's exciting is that none of the playwrights who are doing this have ever done the 24-hour plays before. And can you oh. name the playwrights or some of them at least? I yes. mean, Josh Harmon. Who you Josh Harmon, yeah. who yeah. Gideon has worked with quite a bit. Um, Megan Kennedy, um, Ming Pfeiffer, Alex Lubisher, uh, Jeray Holder, and I'm leaving someone out, uh, Jenny Rachel Weiner. And they're just this amazing collection of writers, all of whom have come up through the Roundabout Underground, our little black box program, where they had their professional debuts in New York. And sort of part of the culture of that program is keeping them in the family. Once they have their debut, we immediately commission their next play and keep them working with Roundabout, which has yielded wonderful results. Plays like Stephen Karam's Sons of the Prophet and The Humans came out of that pipeline. And, uh, and so these are all these wonderful early career playwrights trying their hand at this crazy night for the first time. If you commission a play mm -hmm. and then they come up with a play that you don't care for, <laughs> do you have to do it? <laughs> uh -oh. No, it's not, you're not obligated. We commission every single one of the Roundabout Underground playwrights and so far those of them who have finished writing yeah. their next play and turned them in, we've said yes to almost all of them. I think we're on our sixth or seventh one of those commissions that has turned into a production at the Laura so Pell Theater where this event is. And, and you don't have to name names. <laughs> Any regrets on some of the plays that have been? None. None. I, I genuinely. That's astounding. Yeah, I genuinely. I mean, the program has only been around for about we're in our eleventh season now, and That's I've still been still a long time. That's yeah. a lot of plays. It's a done lot by of plays. Untested. But writers. But they, they gain their testing by staying with us through that. And but, that's kind well, of the wonderful Well, what's interesting, it. too, is that it's uh, it's pretty great how s some playwrights and actors, because you, Gideon, you started mm -hmm. yeah. at the underground, which we, we when you say black box, you're not kidding. It's like in the <laughs> third basement. Yep. <laughs> in the ninth circle of, mm -hmm. no, yeah. not hell, because that's, you know, Ninth circle great, of 46th Street. Ninth yeah. circle of 46th Street. <laughs> it is a truly a great aspect of a non of what a nonprofit theater should do. It's yes. it's tremendous because we all know that the best work is done in small intimate spaces. That's where the, you know, but it's so expensive to take a piece well, first of all a piece of real estate in New York City and then uh, and, and put on a play. It's astounding paying these realtors and paying the the union people and, and they all deserve their money. I'm not saying that it's tough in this town, and that is why Roundabout is great. Yeah, it's amazing the the empire that Todd Hames has pulled together that that he and then continue to support this kind of work as well as the big Broadway stuff they do. They could pay us fifty dollars more. I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Underground doesn't doesn't even make a profit, does it? No, the underground is built to lose money, basically. Yeah, right. It's uh, But that's why, you know, it's all about balance in our seasons. You do yes. those bigger Broadway shows, and then that allows us to do programs like the underground. We've got to wrap up because, as we're taping this on March 23rd, 2018, Richard Kind, you are driving to Washington, D.C. For, for your three children. For your three, for the March for Our Lives. Mm -hmm. Coming up Fantastic. tomorrow. Yep. Oh, bravo. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks and for so having we've us. Got the, the 24-hour plays at the Underground Theater. Am I saying 24-hour plays off-Broadway at the Underground? At the Laura Pels Theater. Laura Pels on 46th Street. Get there to be one of the 400 in the audience. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jill Rafeson, Richard Kind, Gideon Glick, for coming by. Thanks for having us. Thank right. you. And thank Thanks. you, Elizabeth Vincentelli, well, thank as you. always. Now here with me again is Jason Zinneman, a critic at the New York Times who writes about both theater and comedy. And also he is the author of Letterman, The Last Giant of Late Night, which is just about out on paperback. That's right. That's right. That's right. And in the hot seat is my <laughs> sometimes guest co-host, Jesse Green, co-chief theater critic of the New York Times. And we had you in today because you wrote a wonderful think piece in this week's New York Times, The Agony and the Ecstasy of Writing Negative Reviews. Well, I didn't mean to write a wonderful think piece. I, I meant to write a, a terrible think piece. Well, a, a pensive <laughs> think piece. And this was inspired, as it happens, not that you haven't written other negative reviews, but by a negative <laughs> review you wrote of Escape to Margaritaville, a Jimmy Buffett musical that just opened on Broadway, which you did not like. I didn't like it, and I wrote a very straight ahead pan. Not a negative review, a pan. Mm -hmm. We all get the difference, you know. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. I would say it was, it maybe was all the way over to scathing. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what happened is, of 
course, there were tons of comments. Uh, Jimmy Buffett has a huge fan base. He's, you know, one of the most successful singer-songwriters of, of our time. Got to give him credit for that. And his fans are called Parrot Heads, and they were none too pleased. <laughs> and uh, let it be known, as is their right, uh, often in comments on the Times website and elsewhere. And so the editors thought, well, you know, when we have an audience engaged in this way, let's keep them engaged and provoke them further. So <laughs> they asked me to and you told, put myself on the line. You told me that people also tweeted you saying, oh, why don't you chill out and have a drink and, and things like that. Yeah, there's, it's, it's an interesting thing that's happened because of social media and because of a, uh, the, the lessening of the understanding of the framework of criticism and mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. critics do and how a, how a review by a professional journalist is different from an opinion you might have on your, you know, anyone might have, which is quite valid. Uh, but they're different things and uh, you, you get a kind of response that is as if you actually came to their home and murdered their and dog. And attacked them, yes. No, no, their pet. Yeah. <laughs> it's worse than if you attacked them. <laughs> and uh, they feel that they need to respond in kind to kind of balance things out. So Jason, what is the responsibility of a critic, what is the responsibility of a for real critic? You know. Well, I mean, I think first of all, this is people should read the story. Yes. So Jesse uh, wrote a great piece, and I think it's more necessary than ever before uh, because, in a lot of ways, I think negative criticism is under threat, and, and cri critics are increasingly. I'd, I'd be curious to hear if you agree with that, but are incentivized away from writing that kind of review. But I think you know Jesse articulated it really well, which is uh, criticism is a branch of journalism. It's a pursuit of truth. And, and in this case, you, you and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you're, you're reporting on your own thoughts and feelings. Um, if you lied about your own thoughts and feelings, if to uh, avoid criticism or to be more diplomatic or to you know, do whatever, people are going to stop trusting you. And when people don't trust you, to report accurately on your own feelings, you're useless as a critic. Also, I think something that's begun to disappear is the idea that you can enjoy reading opinions that differ from your own and, in fact, learn from them. Not necessarily, no one who loves Margaritaville is going to learn to hate it because they read my pan. But if they read enough of my reviews, they, they'll know kind of what, what my take is on things and it will help them define their own taste. Or if I do my job well, it can. I grew up reading a lot of critics, some of whom wrote loathsome stuff. John Simon is an example. And I would read that stuff, some of it virulently, virulently homophobic. And I was a little gay boy. And I still ate it up. I understood He's where he was writer, coming yeah. from. And he was such a good writer. He is I a could, good writer. I could put that in, in a context and learn from him, even though I disagreed with him. That seems to be disappearing. And you mentioned disincentivizing. Uh, very negative reviews, the, the social atmosphere. And that is something I totally feel because I'm a snowflake. I, I really oughtn't to be a critic because I'm so thin-skinned mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and because a lot of the people out there are now, in essence, Trump. But that was a bold thing that you, you said in the piece, and I've heard you say this before, that you're thin-skinned, which for a critic is sort of a transgressive thing to, to confess to. Because in particular, look, I Jesse won't say this because he's, you know, believes you dish out, you could take it, but being the chief theater critic in the New York Times, you take... A, you've always taken a huge amount of heat. Yes. A yes. huge amount of heat from all sorts of p different kinds of people. Um, but now, in the age of social media, I can't even imagine the amount of heat you take on, a no on an average review. Well, uh, I, I don't, honestly, I try to limit what I take in from that because it's not helpful. The smartest responses will, you know, won't be phrased in those ways. So, I, and I get those via an email or sometimes on my Facebook page, although they found my Facebook page now and that's filled with, you know, you and your Yale degree talking down to us. It's like, oh, please. Talking <laughs> down to us. Uh, oh, I'm, I have I, to say, I think you like Margaritaville better than I did, but. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, what's your pan? Well, no, I and mean, then my pan's not interesting because I'm not in your position, except to say that I think it's so important that you're doing what you're doing in an age where, uh, so many people are operating below the level of their own intelligence to make a buck, and that and that okay, and yes. that that's a yeah, problem. I, I, I do want to say that I'm not. I, I don't tend toward the scathing mm -hmm. when something's just bad. Mm -hmm. uh, when something's 
bad, but uh, I can appreciate the intentions of the author or the artists, or there's mitigating factors of some kind for me. I will look for those things to say as well as genuinely criticizing. But when I get the whiff, as I got a very powerful alcoholic whiff off of Margaritaville of cynicism, it puts things into a different category. I am not obligated to promote the business of Broadway. Look, people, many, many people will love the show. Yes. That has to be yes. acknowledged, and they should. I, I'm not troubled by people enjoying things I don't like. I wonder why they're so troubled about my not enjoying something they do like. But I think it's also worth mentioning, and Jesse does, that, look, negative reviews sting, and the artists spend years putting this stuff together. Critics, and Jesse is, you know, one of them, do, shouldn't take this uh, lightly, and he doesn't. Um, and, you know, some critics have not, over the years, have said, have said they don't think about this, but I, I know it's true. It also has an impact on box office. This is a heavy responsibility to write uh, you know, reviews for a place like the New York Times. Um, that said, that the, it doesn't mean we don't have an obligation to write negative. If we don't write negative reviews, then we're, you, can't, you can't trust what we're going to say. Yeah, I feel worse about reviews that, that come from the New York Times. I'm not going to name names, but you know where there's a work which I feel come from the, the soul of the artist, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't work out, and then you're obligated to not like it. Whereas I didn't feel that that this musical Margaritaville was coming, the, the, the heartfelt song Margaritaville perhaps comes from Jimmy Buffett's soul, but I didn't feel that no, the it, show No, it's was a corporate creation yeah. of the enterprise that, that creates resorts mm -hmm. and all kinds of other things around the world, and good for them. They, he has a net worth of $500 million or something like that. I don't know why all these people are so furious about the potential that you know some extra million might not come to him because of my review. But be that as it may, no one is saying you can't enjoy this show. I'm just telling you I didn't, here's why, and you can place yourself uh, on, the, on the rainbow of appreciation based on <laughs> knowing where I am. You were on the end of this because you were assigned by the New York Times to write the review for Hugh Jackman in The Last Showman. Or The Greatest Showman. The Greatest Showman, which I, which I think you dealt with very decorously, but you didn't particularly like it. You, you did not particularly like it, and I think you heard about that, didn't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I, like, uh, I wrote a negative review of The Greatest Showman, uh, and like a lot of critics, and the review became a massive hit, and people the loved it. The movie became a the movie. I'm sorry, became a massive hit. And I, uh, the Times actually wrote a story about the kind of incongruity between the critical reception and the uh, audience reception. And I got some letters. I got one letter from a, a incredibly articulate high school student in New York who said, you know, at my high school they, they teach you that art matters, and. Uh, I, I read your review of The Greatest Showman, and you clearly are not capable of understanding how great this was. <laughs> and then you, she excoriated me very articulately for, for two pages. And uh, at the end of it, I honestly, it was moving to me. And I thought, I did my job. Because part, you know, as Jesse says in his piece, fighting about art is, is part, part, not only part of the fun of it, but it shows that there's something serious at stake. Here was a person who cared so passionately about hating my review that she uh, not only wrote this response, but you know, cr d d uh, sort of defined her own aesthetic in opposition to mine, which is exactly how it should work. You know, that's how like, like when Jesse grew up reading John Simon, or I have people I grew up reading who I also disagree with. I learned what I thought in opposition to what critics did. So there is an element of criticism that we're the kind of clown in a dunking booth. We're, <laughs> we're, we're supposed to be that. But only with, only with negative reviews. You, nobody's complaining very hard at you when you rave about something. Well, they do quietly. See, I think about this a lot, that I, that I actually never really am angry with a critic who doesn't like something that I like. Mm -hmm. But I am angry with a critic who overpraised something I buy a ticket to and mm -hmm. I and uh, I'm and I said this is this is complete. And uh, most people I know, and I, I have a bias. I have a lot of critic friends who see a lot of culture are actually more upset by a positive review of something. I go, Mr. X strikes again. <laughs> I, I guess that's true, but I don't hear from them as much and not yes. as virulently. But you brought up something I think is worth mentioning, which is uh, many people wrote to me complaining that about something they feel a critic ought to do that I did not do, which is to report on the response of other people in the audience. So you've, you've gotten these yep. emails and things like that where they say, well, everybody else in the audience was having a good time. They were standing up at the end, 
spontaneous standing ovations and laughing like crazy, crazy throughout the whole thing, and you ignored all of that. Now, I'm not, well, but let's look at that for a second. I, I'd like to ask Jason, because I don't know what the answer is. Wh what do you feel about that criticism, of criticism? I think if, uh, if that was our job, we would just be reporters reporting what the audience said. We would have no use. I mean, I th I, I, I'd be curious, because this is to your point, your last, one of the many kind of interesting provocative lines you get is your, your kicker, the last line, where you say the job is to be a theater snob, which is, I think, you know, in this age, actually a very bold thing to say. Um, yes, my editor called me and he said, I love this piece. Are you sure you want to say that as your last line? And I said, is, it, is there something wrong with it? He said, no, it's very strong, but you're going to have that hung around your neck for the rest of your life. And he's right. More power to you, Jesse Green, <laughs> co-chief theater critic of the New York Times. I was just thinking that you must, get, you must go to comedy things all the time where they're uh, laughing and hooting and raving and you're thinking. You learn you can't trust the audience response. Oh, what do you I'm... write in your notebook when I write, help me, help me? <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of things do you write? If you take kill me. me, kill me, kill me, kill me, yeah. Okay. All right, very good. It's so lovely to see you, Jesse. Nice Great to be on this you. side of the table. Thank you, Jason. I look forward to the return of both of you very soon. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.